Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, um, our October 29th, our last actually um, present um, event this year that will be hosted by um, CSA. Uh, the next two um, are one's going to be hosted by RSA, and then the, another one is by ISSA. And I'll get more details very, very shortly. But thank you, everyone, for being here. It is a pleasure. It's an honor. I greatly appreciate your time and support for CSAMN. Um, uh, again, uh, you are an invaluable resource. And, and um, as I always encourage, I appreciate any feedback regarding you know, um, how this event went or if you're interested in um, another event. So please uh, keep that feedback coming back. Um, so for today's event, we are, um, I, I'm Kerry Manister, I'm the president of uh, the, the Cloud Security Alliance Minnesota chapter. Um, again, like I said, it's a, a great pleasure to have everyone here. I'm very, very excited to have Neil from RSA uh, present today. Um, this has been a, a long time planning, you know, this year with RSA. We, we have a strategic partnership with RSA and we're trying new things um, with COVID, with um, event fatigue. Um, you know, uh, we're, we are just trying different things to continue the conversation, to get more hands-on experiences. And again, you know, um, we want to try to be creative with, with our sponsors. And, and this is one thing that we're, we're trying to do and we're going to show you what we're, we're trying to bring to you and what I mean is that this event today is really a prelude um, to our threat hunting, you know, you know, educational side of, um, you know, of CSAMN. And this prelude is going to give you a, a good bird's eye overview of threat hunting and, and what it takes to be a threat hunter. Um, I'll, I'll get into a little bit of, of Neil's background, but what I also want to share with you right now is that in addition today, we're going to have a hands-on workshop coming up in November. And this is truly, um, there'll be some discussion at the very, very beginning. And then literally you're gonna have your own instance of a threat hunting tool, and you're gonna go through the same steps, you know, hands on as a threat hunter would. And I, I have experienced it. Um, this is actually a, a newer module that RSA has. And so I'm gonna be taking this as well. And I really, really encourage if you're here today, please, you know, jump on this and, and, and get a thought and a feel for how a threat hunter is. If you are a threat hunter, extremely good experience. If you're a security professional, again, I really, really highly recommend it. It's, you know, any security professional, we, you know, CSA, our goal is to um, recommend best security practices. And we strongly feel as a board and even as an executive board that, understanding how threat actors work, what, you know, how do they come in? What do they look for? The types of ports they come in, the types of services that they look for. It will just help you be a better security professional. And so uh, again, um, Chris is going to uh, copy um, this link into our chat. I, I, again, we highly recommend um, just click it and um, you'll be able to register um, on an RSA page co-branded with um, CSA. Another unique thing that we're trying to do here is the conversation. What, what we've experienced with, um, with our events is that it's, it's a point in time and uh, you know, questions are asked, they're answered, but you know, what we're trying to do here is trying to con continue that dialogue. And so what we've set up, we're piling into this with RSA and we, we set it up in our circle environment. And our, our circle environment is a free peer-to-peer -peer environment for any Cloud Security Alliance member. This is set up by a global headquarters. And what we're trying to do here is after this event, if you have a question, if you, you know, want to know about a career in threat hunting, if you want to ask a technical question, if you want to see, you know, ask more about best practices, you know, from, from their point of view, from RSA, we actually have the RSA threat team monitoring those chats and they will answer it, you know, um, you know, from the, the team will answer, you know, any question. So I really, really encourage you to see if you like this idea, you know, any feedback is much appreciated, but, you know, if you're gonna take the threat hunting, you know, um, workshop, 
here's your chance to ask some questions about it to get more details. Maybe you're not sure about it. Maybe you're not sure if it's for you know, right for you. Ask them. You know, they're there. They're going to be monitoring. We're going to be assisting, you know, the board in, in monitoring and making sure that your questions get asked. But uh, again, this is another way that we're trying to engage, you know, the Cloud Security Alliance, Minnesota chapters trying to engage members, you know, in Minnesota and because of COVID also around the world, because there's not only people just from Minnesota that are joining us today. The other thing I'm, I'm really, really excited about is that we are partnering with ISA and we're going to have our first event coming um, December 15th. And th this is, um, you know, we're joining forces uh, and, and trying to bring, you know, different points of views of, um, you know, from a security perspective, you know, specifically from cloud. And I, I'm really happy to say that uh, Ops Compass is going to be talking about the management plane. That's the the single biggest difference of when you go from a traditional, you know, you know, networking infrastructure to to the cloud is the management plane, and they're and they're going to share their experiences with how to manage the. The, the 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 management plane they're going to show a tool that that captures all the events and what you do with that information so uh, again a, a really good conversation unfortunately i don't have what um who the speaker is going to be for for isa there's going to be two speakers at that event at that december 15th event so as soon as i uh, we get that information we'll send it out out to you and then also with a registration link for that december 15th event and again, that, that that event is free. You don't have to be an ISA um, um, Minnesota member to join that event. The other thing too that ISA is having on November 17th, you know, not so far around the corner, is um, they're going to have uh, Sandra Joyce speaking. And and again, you know, I read about her background. And she has a very very interesting background, and to see her perspective um, uh, about um, you know the global. A way that she views global intelligence. So, uh, again, the link um, we'll be pasting the link in the chat, and any of the links that we've shown will be in the chat. So, you know, again, again, we encourage you know to support ISA just like they're supporting us, and and uh, and and join them for the event. Just some just some thoughts here, you know, we we about our event is that we're recording it, so you'll be able to see it. So if you have to jump off, totally understand. Uh, we have now a YouTube video channel where all our events are, um, so you're able to watch it at any time. Um, if you have a question, you know, feel free to try to talk, but you could also put it in the chat. There's multiple board members that are going to be monitoring the chat, including myself. You know, it, if there's any background noise, and, and again, this Neil for you too. Um, we're going to mute everyone. So Neil, if you're talking and we mute everyone, you're going to have to unmute yourself. I apologize, I didn't mention that earlier. And then finally, um, our board is based on feedback. You know, we can only get better with your feedback and input. If something's bad, we want to hear about it. If something's good, we want to hear about it as well. If we're not doing something, we want to hear about it. The best way to communicate to us is at info at csamn.org. It is monitored. Normally, we get back to you within 24 hours. So again, any feedback or any input is much appreciated. And then, as always, you know, again, thank you, you know, Neil. Um, you know, for, for doing this and sponsoring us. Thank you, anyone from RSA who's on this event. We really appreciate your partnership and willingness to work with us and pilot new things and try new things out. And then Jason from Microsoft, I don't know if you're on, but you know, you know, without you this year, we wouldn't be able to pivot and even do any of these events. And um, we owe you so much. And I, I know Chris feels the same way as well. So, um, you know, as soon as we could have a beer, I mean, we're going to have a beer. <laughs> I'll take you up on that. It's our, ple <laughs> our pleasure to do that. I mean, this has been a it's been a tough year for everyone, and so anything we can do to help, we'll keep we'll continue to do so. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Jason. And then I, I, again, all the members. Um, it's been a very very humbling experience, you know, this year. And um, your support, you know, we wouldn't be here today. There's a lot of positive things that's happened, and I'm really really happy to tell everyone here. We we now have our executive um, board established. And it's uh, it's 12 CISOs from around Minnesota that are going to be advising us and helping us um, and building our future. And so I, I really, really encourage you to get get engaged. Um, we'll be sharing a lot of cool things coming up in in, in 2020. Brittany Kaiser as a um, uh, you know the 
Chris, Brit Brittany Kaiser, you just want to give a little intro about Brit Brittany Kaiser and sorry to put you on the spot. You're better than I am if you're still there. So, so Brittany Kaiser was the, um, she was the one that uh, started the Cambridge Analytica with Facebook. So she's actually going to be speaking. She's, uh, she's a Minnesotan. She's uh, alumni to Chris's school. And, um, you know, she just, you know, when we asked her to present for us, you know, it, she's just doing it because, you know, of the cause and what we're trying to do here. So that's coming. We, we, we absolutely 100% confirmed it with Brittany um, actually yesterday. So that's going to be coming um, in January. So I'm really excited to to share that with everyone. And now that it's uh, permanent, it's, it, it's, it's going to be happening. So what I'd like to do right now is introduce Neil, who's going to be going through the threat hunting um, and incident response and, and give you a high level overview. A little bit about Neil. He's uh, 20 years of, uh, of, you know, of being a security professional. He's, he's had online interviews. He's been on film. He's been on television. Um, he's also authored uh, several book, books. I really, really encourage, I've gotten to know Neil, um, you know, I really, really encourage you to ask questions um, and, and really try to make this as interactive as possible. And, and again, remember, if, if uh, you have any questions afterwards, you know, get on Circle, get to the threat hunting community, just join it. And um, you, could, you could ask questions and we can continue the dialogue, you know, um, with RSA and with CSA members, you know, because I'm sure the questions that you have are, are questions that other people have. So, Neil, it is all yours. Thanks. All right. I'm just going to go ahead and share. Let me know when you can see that. We good? We good. All right. OK, so um, so I'm just going to roll straight into it, I guess. First off, thanks for the introduction. I was going to uh, intro myself, but but I appreciate it. Um, so um, so who am I? I am Neil Weiler in the information security community. I'm better known as Grifter. Um, by day, I'm a principal threat hunter for RSA. That means I travel out to our largest or most important customers and, and spend time in their environments hunting through their stuff and trying to find um, the bad we don't know about or they don't know about. And um, and then by night, I, um, I also uh, moonlight as um, the lead of all technical operations for the Black Hat security briefings. So I've been doing that for 18 years. Um, and I'm also one of the main organizers of DEF CON, which is the largest hacker convention in the world. So um, I've been around a while. I think it's just uh, being old, I think, <laughs> but uh, but I'll take it. Um, I am also part of the review board for Black Hat. I speak at conferences all over the place. All that stuff is supposed to make you want to listen to what I have to say following this. Um, you don't have to, um, but, but it'd be cool if you did. Um, so... Oh, I guess I will say too, um, I know that I'm with RSA and I've been with RSA now in like five years, but we're not talking about any products today. So if you're worried you're about to get pitched something, uh, that's not my bag. So um, we're just going to talk about threat hunting, why it's important, and then we'll roll into the labyrinth here in a little bit. So, um, so what is threat hunting, right? Well, here's a nice shiny definition. It says uh, proactively searching through data in order to detect threats which have evaded traditional security measures. Now, that's great. Um, if you're explaining it to somebody who isn't in information security um, or just somebody up the management chain, like saying like, this is what we're doing. We're taking a proactive approach to find things that our blinky boxes aren't finding. It's a good way um, of explaining it to others. Um, but really what it is to us, to, to the folks in the trenches is um, it's just doing IR before you know that you're owned. Right, we do a lot of the same things. We're going in and we're searching and we're saying, okay, well, how did they get in? What tools did they use? What are, you know, what was taken? What was left behind? Um, but we're doing that not knowing if somebody's there. So we're going and looking in those places um, before we have uh, confirmation that there is a problem. What it is not is not Googling for an IOC, right? So um, I one of the parts of my role when I go out to um, customers or into 
um, like managed service providers or partners and that kind of thing is is sometimes to just assess their threat hunting program and, and kind of consult on that. Um, what I will find sometimes is that organizations will be like, oh, yeah, we have a threat hunting program. And it's like, well, how do you do that? And they're like, well, we get our threat intelligence feeds and we get our stuff each morning. We get something new and then we just search the environment for that um you know that thing so it's like well that's not really hunting that's just searching um so uh we'll get into what hunting actually is here and where you get where you get value out of it um now something to keep in mind is that threat hunting can become ir so if you're starting out looking for something um there's a chance that you might find it um, and if you do, you just need to know um, what your incident response plan is and how you can, um, you know, take the right steps to, you know, get the right folks involved if you do find something. So having threat hunters who are um, familiar with your incident response plan is huge. Um, please make sure that, um, that you have that in place. Now, why do we hunt? Well, we're hunting to look for, you know, previously undetected threats, things that we don't know about. And we do it because we're trying to reduce the dwell time that the attacker is persisting within the environment. Um, we are playing a game of hide and seek where, you know, we're we're going to do a lot better if we start seeking, right? It's going to be a lot easier to find someone if we go and actually look. Uh, we don't want to end up being in the situation where, um, when we eventually detect a breach or something within our environment, when we start to do the, um, you know, the homework there and say, what is, uh, how long has this been here? It's been a month. It's been two months. It's been three months. It's been a year. Uh, I think seven years is one of the longer ones that I've heard where attackers, there's evidence that the attackers were in the environment for that long. Um, so we want to reduce that dwell time, give them less time to exfiltrate data, give them less time to stage for a ransomware attack, whatever it is. Um, so we're going in and looking for the bad uh, before we we get some alert from a device that, that exists within the environment. Now, another reason to hunt is just because you're going to learn your environment better than you ever have before. And I think for, for me, I think this is the biggest hidden return on investment for an organization to give their analysts or their, um, you know, SOC team time to hunt is they're going to understand why things are architected the way they are, why certain products were chosen, um, why the golden image is set the way that it is and the applications that exist on it are there. Like having those discussions um, with you know the IT team, like often the relationship between IT and security can be a contentious one because we're always the group that says, no, you can't do that. No security, no, because security. Um, and so we just make IT's job a bit harder, but we want to open up those paths those, that, to communication so that we can say, I need to understand why we do things the way that we do. I need to understand why things are architected this way so that when I see something, I can say, oh, well, that's just the way that we set it up. Or, oh that's be we choose these applications because of these reasons um <clears throat> it's going to um give you a huge advantage over the attacker i can assure you as somebody who spent many years on the offensive side of security that the first thing an attacker is going to do when they come into your environment is try to learn everything that they can so that they can move laterally or persist within the environment for um you know as long as possible so um, do yourself a favor and learn your environment really, really well, uh, because that's what the attacker is going to do as soon as they get in. It's also going to allow you while you're hunting to just, you know, improve your overall organizational posture, right? So you're going to find problems before an attacker finds them and exploits them. You'll be able to find those gaps and say, OK, we need to shore this up or this thing looks like it's misconfigured and talk to the right teams to get those issues resolved um, before somebody else you know, finds that for you and you're forced into a situation where you're responding to something rather than taking those steps on your own. Um, it's about reducing your your overall attack surface, right? So that you can uh, limit the opportunities that you're handing to attackers when they're looking to exploit your environment. Um, also, hunting just makes your analysts better. Um, I can say one, just from a morale standpoint. So as somebody who um, has been an analyst before, um, I can say that you know uh, analyst fatigue is real and burnout is real. 
Um, you what you want to do is get your analysts in front of a problem and allow them to get into that investigative mindset. Actually put into practice all of the, you know, training and conference talks and blog posts they've read and all the different things rather than just being like, okay, I come in in the morning, I sit down, I open up the queue, I pull an incident out and see what it is. Uh, did our mitigations work? Oh, it looks like they did. That's great. Um, and then, then moving on, right? So we, um, we get into a place where we're doing that over and over and over again and what it does is it makes us complacent right it makes us start to to say like oh yeah i'm sure it works let me look i'm sure it worked with hunting you actually get to sit down and say okay if it was me who attacked us how would i have come into our environment or where are the places that i would attack if it was me who was trying to you know exfiltrate data from our environment where would i exfiltrate data from um, and going and looking in those places and spending you know time doing that is incredibly rewarding organization but also as an analyst yourself you can say um, you know, oh, I actually like went and looked for something I wanted to look at today. Or, um, you know, you're really interested in a particular type of technology or uh, you're really focused on um, a certain protocol and you're, you know, you're that person for that protocol. So um, you're like, oh, I'm going to go hunt in DNS today and I'm going to go try to find something really good. Um, it's it's a great you know place to, um, to again, just boost overall um, morale of your team. So where do we start? Well, we start with the gold standard for decades and the gold standard for decades to come. I'm sure we start with logs, right? Log and capture all the things. So um, collect OS event logs, app logs, authentication logs, security devices, whatever it is. If it is a router switch, firewall, um, you know, and it creates a log and a virus. If it creates a log, log it. Just write it to disk. Um, having it available should an incident uh, actually kick off and you're responding to um, a, you know, a potential breach or a confirmed breach, having as many logs as you can um, is, is key to figuring out what was going on. So even if you don't even look at your logs, but please look at your logs, um, you know, like I said, if something creates a log, just log it um, and if you don't have a sim or you don't have some other tool that helps you make sense of it and you're literally just dumping it to disk at least you have those things if you need them um, so please log all uh, all you can and don't forget on the network side your uh, web server logs and your proxy logs um, but another personal favorite of mine is um, full packet capture so if you don't have full packet capture in your environment it's time to put full packet capture in your environment and I say that um, because, because I like full packet capture to video surveillance for your network. Um, when you're, if you were building a new building today and you were like, oh yeah, we decided that, you know, the badge scanners on the door, you know, log everybody who comes in and, and, and goes out. So we're, we're fine. We've got a log of, of who's in the building. Um, so we're just not going to put in cameras. People would stare at you like you had six heads, right? They'd be like, you, wait a minute, you're not going to put cameras in the building? It's like, no, 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 because we've got the logs from people badging in. Um, full packet capture is that for your network. It's video surveillance for your network. You can see who came in, where they went, what they were wearing, what they were carrying, was somebody else with them? What did they do when they came inside? How did they move around? Did they look suspicious? What was happening, right? That's what full packet capture is. It allows you to be able to say like, oh, I could watch this individual move around the network. They interacted with these things. Here are the files that they interacted with. And I can actually pull those files out of the stream and see if they are what they say they are. I noticed that they took something with them or downloaded something. What is that? So that if you end up in a situation where you again, you're responding to a breach or there's potential exfiltration, now you can pull the files out that the attackers took and say, what did they get? And that changes the game as far as how you respond um, to a breach. You know, you might end up on the 10 o'clock news or you might just have to let the board know that there was a problem. Um, so full packet capture gives you that visibility. Um, and you um, like 
you just like put something in place, whether it's a small uh, a small amount of a full packet where you're doing like three days of raw and you know a month's worth of metadata, then then great. Start there and then just grow it, you know, as as time goes on. Now, of hey, course, Neil. we also yeah. And hey, yeah, I got some uh, you know here's some challenges like small to medium sized organizations um, and, and even some large organizations. One, it, it costs a lot of money. And then two is that, you know, they mean, you know, again, the full patch of capture costs money, all of this. If, if you had a recommendation, is there one or two things that you can do? And, um, you know, how can you, how can you be proactive, but yet not spend a lot of money? Is well, there, there, if there's such a thing. Well, so there's um, there's actually, I mean, there's enough open source solutions out there as far as um, whether it's a SIM or full packet capture or endpoint solution or whatever that literally like all of the things that you walk on an expo floor at somewhere like Black Hat or RSA conference and people are trying to, to sell you, um, you can do it with an open source solution. So as far as like, uh, cost is concerned you can limit the cost the the trade-off at least personally to me is that you end up uh you you end up trading uh time in in managing that solution um because it's something that's an open source solution they're not always as turnkey as something you might get from a, you know a vendor uh, or some enterprise solution where someone else is managing things for you so instead of um where if you have um you know, if you if you've got the budget for OPEX where you can just throw people at it, then great. Um, but if you've got, you know, you know, CapEx, then then buy something from a vendor. Um, it's it's one of the situations, too, where like if you were, let's say, a university or you're somebody who's lucky enough to have like interns and you're like, hey, intern, you're responsible for managing security onion or bro or whatever it is that you're. You know, pointing them at then then great. Um, but not everybody is in that situation either. So it's a trade off on either dollar spent or time managing the solution. But um, but all of the things that like a normal sock should have like logs, full packet, endpoint, um, you know, there's there are open source solutions out there uh, that that folks can can go out and grab. Um, I'm going to keep going. So I know that this is a lot of data, like, but, you know, big data is something that was being trumpeted to us for the last decade. It is part of your life now. Um, like I mentioned, start small, then start with um, a small amount of uh, of whatever the solution is that you decide to go with. And then uh, once you have demonstrated the value of that data, it's often easier to to, you know, go to management and say like, hey, I need to get a budget to expand this. We were able to find these things um, using this. And if we can expand our window from three days to seven days or 14 days or 30 days, like we believe that we're going to get this much return on investment for her, for doing that. Um, and again, whether that is open source or, or a vendor solution, uh, that's up to you. But but start out um, start out small and then just grow from there. Um, on the host side, right? Uh, inventory all your processes on all your systems, what the process names are, the past parent-child relationships. Um, you know, look for process injection, hooking artifacts in your shim cache and am cache. Like, really, just know what your applications are doing. What's kicking off on a host? Um, what is you know what is the parent process for that? If we're seeing something you know like command.exe coming, uh, where the parent process is is winword.exe, then you know maybe we have an issue. Uh, why is PowerShell trying to connect to the internet? That that type of thing. Understand what your applications are doing, and when it comes to things like persistence, like you have to look beyond your run keys, right? We want to look at scheduled tasks, services with typos, blank descriptions, stuff like that. Now, this seems like foundational stuff, right? Like it's like oh, uh, logs, packets, endpoint, uh, inventory processes, that kind of thing. Yeah, like it is foundational stuff, but it is where we find the bad all the time. Um, I, I have been in many, many customers over the, the five years that I've been with RSA. I also spent um, the first portion of my uh, career with RSA as a member of the CERC doing threat hunting for RSA. Um, and 
the foundational stuff is where we find uh, a lot of really uh, bad things. Um, the reason that that is is that despite what the um, who the attacker is, um, they will take the path of least resistance. And so, if you're if they don't need to burn a zero day on your environment, they're not going to. They're going to first try the things that work all the time, and these are the things that work all the time. So, um, so you know, pay attention to those things, and then on your network, just understand. Um, how your network is architected, right? What are your ingress and egress points? How does data flow into and out of your environment? Um, what, how are your subnets configured, right? What's your subnet scheme? Um, what your internal boundaries are, right? So um, how are how is the network segmented? How does data flow laterally so that you can understand, you know, hunting uh, for lateral movement? And then, um, you know, directionality is huge. If you're um, if you're looking at a certain type of data, but it's going outbound, you don't care. Where if it was coming inbound, you care a lot, right? There's um, there's things that when you're looking at um, at potential problems, inbound, outbound, or lateral matters a lot. Now, I will say that if you're hunting laterally, um, endpoint is probably a better place to do that, just because lateral traffic is so chatty. Um, so it's a better use of your time to to hunt within inbound and outbound traffic and then use your endpoint solution um, to to do any lateral hunting. Um, I will say directionality, though, is really, really important. When I go out into a new customer environment, normally the first half of the first day is just spent understanding how data flows within the environment or how their IP addresses are set up, what is actually external and what is internal, and, and how are things segmented is huge to understanding what's normal and what's not. So I can't stress the importance of, of directionality enough when it comes to a network hunt. Um, and then what's just normal for the environment is direct IP communication normal. Um, it, it's something that, again, like we look at direct IP communication and we think like, oh, OK, well, that's just some server somewhere or whatever. Well, what's on the other end of it? Uh, create a, a feed, a list, something you can feed into your tool that says like this IP address maps to this particular resource so that you're not always going, what's that IP address? Because um, I don't know about you, but when I see some like a cool website, I don't say like, oh, this is a great site. You should go to 64.218.32. Whatever, right? We give a host name and that's what we go with. Now machines go direct IP all the time and maybe we do for certain things, but most users don't and hunting is about finding the anomalies right so um so pay attention to stuff like that dynamic dns is that something you use within your environment um because it's uh if it if it's not something that you're using normally it can just be a sign either one of command and control we still see command and control using dynamic dns and with the apis that some of these dynamic dns services have written um they have gotten really, really useful um, for command and control. The way that they communicate or are able to switch without losing communication to the, you know, to their uh, their malware. Um, and so, look for dynamic DNS. Sometimes it's just a policy violation. You'll find someone who has connecting to a file server at home or a media server at home, but it's still not normal so you take care of it tor is tor within the environment if you see communication to tor that might um, be just somebody who's really into privacy and you go track them down and you probably made a friend because they even know what tor is but you know look for stuff like that we see that in an um, in environment sometimes and we're like well that can't be that can't be right um, so just chase those things down and yes irc um, the original slack with no pictures um, IRC is still used for command and control. We see it used for command and control all the time. Um, and sometimes we just see really interesting things um, where, you know, there's communication within IRC about potential attacks. Um, we've had several of those at Black Hat over the years. Um, so look at IRC, uh, find out, you know, uh, who's using it. If it's normal for that user, then you just add them to an allow list and you move on. It's probably some Unix gray beard sitting in the closet somewhere. Uh, protocol anomalies, right? Look for things where the protocol is just not acting in a way that the, is standard for the RFC. That can clue you into there being a potential issue. And then non-standard or mismatched services reports. Again, sounds super foundational, but I can't even count the number of times that we found stuff where people are just like, oh, I'll throw it on a different port. Um, also, um, we have found things where 
it's somebody who is like an admin somewhere. Somebody set something up in IT and they were like, oh, well, you know, yeah, I left this thing open, but I um, I put it on a different port. So, so people won't find it. And it's like, yeah, that's that's not how this works. Um, so you'll just find, you know, interesting things by looking at non-standard or mismatched services and ports. And you have, and you have a few questions for you. So is it possible to train an ML model to look for all, all these things on the network and perform threat hunting instead of humans? Um, to a degree, I would say, like automation is um, is great for certain aspects of hunting. Now, uh, it is not, I, in my opinion, threat hunting should not be automated. Like as a human driven thing, it's somebody sitting behind a keyboard and looking for the things that our devices aren't finding. This is not like, stuff where it's just oh uh you know it's the same thing as saying like oh well i am looking at you know signatures essentially for antivirus like it's like if we already knew about it then we can create an alert for it and then we just move on now hunting may lead to eventually creating an alert or adding an additional block on something or whatever but um but initially it should be like a human with a certain skill set sitting down behind a keyboard looking for stuff. And now you can create reports if you went through and did a hunt and you were like, well, I went here and then I went here and then I went here and then I filtered this and I filtered this. And then I saw that there were this many outliers and that type of data. So I built a report that now sends me something every day when I come in that says, hey, that thing that you hunted for, it happened three times in the last 24 hours. You may just want to take a look and then you go in and look at it. So this is the stuff that isn't really alertable, um, but it may be of interest to somebody. Now, I will also say things like, you know, folks are looking at things like UEBA, right? Like, so where we're saying like, oh, we're going to put something in line that does behavioral analytics on on our environment. So if something weird occurs, it's going to tell us like, oh, this is weird. Super great technology. It's incredibly helpful. Um, the only thing is that like in some cases we're seeing folks who deploy it and they're saying, oh, yeah, I deployed it and then I just had it set a baseline for us. And now it will just check anything against that baseline. And that can take up to a month for it to actually like dial in a baseline, depending on the environment. Um, and what ends up happening is that they deploy it without setting loose threat hunters first to make sure that the environment is clean. And um, and you end up in a situation where there already is an attacker in the environment that has persisted for whatever period of time, that now their communication and their activity has been baselined by the solution you put in place as being normal. And so that attacker can just live there as long as they want because you're relying on a solution to tell you if something looks out of the ordinary um, and that attacker's behavior now looks ordinary to that device. So. Interesting. Uh, um, when when you talk about behavioral analytics, there's another question, but uh, on that sure. thought, when you're talking about behavioral analytics, isn't it, you know, isn't it important when you when you talk to the person who who's the, the vendor who has that tool is how long is that baseline set for? It's not because that, that you know, if the baseline's for three months versus six months, that's a that's a big difference. It, it, does that make a, a huge deal? Uh, absolutely. I mean, that's the thing. All of these are about like all of the different solutions are there to add, you know, you know, uh, an, another layer to to allowing us to manage what is essentially become almost unmanageable. The amount of data that we deal with now today versus what we were dealing with 10 years ago or 20 years ago is crazy. Um, but it's 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 over reliance on that solution or not doing the care and feeding of those solutions where you do go in and you say, okay, let's once again, have the hunters go out, look for stuff, make sure that they feel that we're clean. And then we're going to reset our baseline and doing those type of things. Like, you know, to your point, like either quarterly or, you know, semi-annually or whatever it is. Um, it, it, the biggest thing is we, we don't want to put ourselves in a situation where we become over reliant on the technologies to just tell us, oh, something's wrong. Um, having a team of folks who have a varied skill set that can go out and look for stuff that that it isn't alertable that you just know or infer because you have lived in that environment for X amount of time and, or know those protocols really well. And so you're just like, that's odd. Right, is that's what we want? Are those well? That's odd moments, and then we go look for, for something within there. 
Gotcha. And then final, what's your take on AI? Um, right now, it's just if then statements, right? So um, <laughs> we're all, I think all of the um, uh, I am I am one. I'm I'm cautiously optimistic. I I hope that eventually we do get to a place where um, where we can use actual or real AI and machine learning to help us um, make sense of all the things that we're doing. But again, I don't think they're a replacement for us. Um, and if it then that becomes the case, then great. Um, you know, I'm I'm I'll be super excited not to have to worry about you know, different breaches because the AI fixes everything. But um, but I just don't think we're we're there yet. And I don't really think we're close. All right, I'll jump back into it. So so where do we start? Well, um, hunting is really about situational awareness, right? So I mean, we just mentioned baseline. So it's about understanding what normal looks like on your host and networks, creating a baseline, and then just diffing against it over and over and over again. Um, so you look at the environment, you say, okay, I think that we are good. And then you say, let me just look to see if anything's different, what changed, what's odd. Um, you want to become intimately aware of what the norms are so that when something happens, when an outlier occurs, an anomaly occurs, it's going to stick out to you like a sore thumb. Like it will just jump out at you and you'll be like, well, that's not right because I've never seen it do that before. That's behaving in a way it hasn't or that user is behaving in a way they've never behaved before. Now, it's important to point out too when it comes to hunting that like you'll find stuff sometimes where I call it seeing something shiny, where you'll see something shiny and you go, oh, like I, I need to take a look at that. And you start digging into something and sometimes you spend an hour or two hours or six hours on something. And in the end, it turns out to be completely benign. It's just, you know, a user was doing something and uh, that was out of the ordinary for them, but it was valid or a protocol was just doing something that is odd for the protocol, but not for the way that it's deployed within your environment. So um, you're not always going to find evil, but whatever you do find, I promise will be interesting. So you have to have that mindset going into it is it's like, OK, you can end up burning four hours on something and then in the end you go, oh, turns out it was fine. And if you can walk away from it saying, ah, but I learned this about that protocol and I learned this about the architecture of the environment or this about user behavior, um, you'll come out of it with something interesting. Um, it just might not be, you know, exfiltration to China. And that's a good thing. Like right? I've gone into customer environments before where I've been called in to go um, spend a week in someone's environment. And at the end of the week, I'm like, you know, we found some like minor things or some like policy violations or some things that we, you know, have recommendations on or whatever, but you're good. Like we are clean. We don't see any problems within the environment. It's architected really well or whatever. And like the customer like looks at you and goes, oh, like I was hoping you would find something cool. And I'm like, you were hoping we would find like, or the sales folks, right? Because they're like, I hope you find exfiltration to China because that would really seal my deal. Um, and you're like, that's that's not what we want. So um, it's fine if you don't find something that's evil, as long as you can put yourself in the mindset that, you know, at least I'm going to learn something. Now, um, again, with this, we want to leave our preconceived notions at the door. We're not starting out with IOCs. We're not Googling for IOCs. We're going to start out with a question. Um, you know, how would I attack us and how would I get in if I was successful in getting in and I wanted to pull together some files that I thought were interesting and exfiltrate them from the environment? One, where would I stage those files and what would I use to to pack them up and get them out of here and then go look for evidence of that behavior, right? So start out with a question. Um, when you've got that question or hypothesis in your mind that, oh, uh, you know, an attacker would probably do this thing and then go and look. That's your plan, right? So when you start at a hunt, know what it is that you're going to go look for, um, but don't be upset if you um, if you don't find it. You can you have to stay flexible. You'll start out looking for one thing, and then you'll see something shiny, and you'll be like, "Oh, what's that?" full stop that's the thing that you care about now you started out with a question about one thing and that question led you down a certain path but then you saw something that caught your attention those are the things that you want to pay attention to now if you see something shiny start investigating that and if you're like oh but i'm committed to this path then great open up another tab or something but 
Um, and I'll do that where I'll be like, well, that's interesting. That's shiny, that's shiny, that's shiny, that's shiny. And I open another tab, open another tab, open another tab. And in the end, I decide, um, OK, um, I just I'm not done with this hunt until all those tabs are closed. You know, and that that will be when this hunt is complete, because then I'll have chased down each of those shiny things. So prepare to pivot. There's going to be a lot of pivoting. Um, but, you know, this is where the ADHD that's so prevalent within our industry is actually a benefit. Um, we want to be looking for something and have something catch our attention, because that is the thing that will often lead us to, um, you know, an attacker or a potential attack. Um, so don't be don't be afraid to to chase those things down. And then, you know, find tools that help you make sense of the data that you're collecting. And again, you know, I know this is going to sound weird coming from a guy who works for RSA, but I don't care what those tools are. They can be open source tools, they can be RSA tools, or they can be one of our competitors. It doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is that you actually want to use them, that your hunters want to use them, that your um, your analysts want to use them, because um, all of the shiny tools in the world don't matter at all if no one wants to use it because it's difficult to use or it's slow or wasn't sized correctly for the environment um, so that when you're doing queries within it, they're taking a long time to return because hunting is, you know, like query, 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 search here, search here, rebuild this session, rebuild this session. And if it takes a long time to do that. It's just soul crushing and no one's going to want to do it. So find the tools that make sense of the data that you're collecting and that work for you, for your analysts, for your hunters, for whatever your team is comprised of and use those things. Um, if you are, uh, as, as we talked about earlier, if you are in the situation where let's say you're a university and you can just throw a bunch of students at something and say, hey, manage this open source solution for <laughs> for us. Um, and then you have your analysts using it, but there's a bunch of students on the other end who are who are actually managing the tool itself. Fantastic. Use that. You know, if it's free, it's me. But if you're not in that situation and you're a security team that's small and limited uh, time and resources and whatever, but you can say, all right, well, we need an enterprise solution because it's going to cut out this much time for us just managing that thing. Also, I've got a support number that I can call if something goes wrong and they get to fix it and I don't have to worry about it. Um, that can be huge. And then when you're doing all this stuff, when you're doing all these hunts, document everything that you're doing, document what you've learned, and then share it out there, um, you know, beyond the ADHD that's so prevalent within our industry. Imposter syndrome is another great one we uh, all seem to deal with a lot. Um, it's time to set that aside. You know, whether it is a blog post, a talk at a conference, or just sending out a tweet, if you learn something interesting, put it out there. Um, it may be the thing that helps somebody else, um, you know, keep an attack from being successful within their environment. So just document what you're doing and share it out to the rest of um, the world. All right, now we talked about like having a plan or coming up with a question that you wanted to ask yourself. And so how do we begin that? Where do we start? Well, we start um, with coming up with a hypothesis. How, and we do that by deciding, you know, all right, well, what business am I in, right? Okay, well, I'm in financial or I'm in, uh, you know, healthcare, I'm in entertainment, I'm in whatever. And we have these types of applications. These are the assets that are important to us. These are our keys to the kingdom. Um, what are the risks to those things? And who's interested in those assets? Um, for each one of those things, understand what your potential uh, or probable attack vectors are, right? So you know who wants to target you, how are they going to attack those things? And for those attack vectors, understand what the techniques that are going to be used to do that um, are going to be or artifacts that will be left behind by that type of, uh, of attack or technique. Um, for those artifacts, like what tools apply? And this is twofold. The tool um, being either um, what will help you find um, the th that particular artifact, but also what tool left that artifact behind if the attacker was using it. So, um, so make sense of those things. Again, document it, write this stuff down, and then red team and blue team it if you can. Um, emulate the types of attacks that are going to be targeted toward your assets, toward your environment or your business, and see if your blue team folks can find 
those attacks. It's better for you to replicate the, um, you know, the tactics, techniques, and procedures of your potential threat groups and see if you can find it. And, and if you can't make the changes or put the things in place that you need to, um, rather than coming up against an actual attacker and, you know, experiencing a breach. And then do this over and over and over again. So for each application, each asset, just what's the attack probable attack vectors? What are the techniques that are going to use? What tools are they going to come at us with? What artifacts do those tools leave behind? Write it all down, emulate it, do it again, do it again, do it again. Um, a good place to come up with some potential um, you know, TTPs toward your uh, particular business is the MITRE ATT&CK framework. If you're not familiar with MITRE ATT&CK, please make yourself familiar with MITRE ATT&CK. It's a great source of really, really good threat intelligence, right? Um, threat, all threat intel is not created equally. Getting a feed of host names, IP addresses, and, um, and file hashes is not the same thing as understanding how potential attackers conduct business and in some cases it is actually business and organized crime or nation states that kind of thing so understanding these are the techniques that are going to be used against us and how do we defend against that and miter attack is a great source of that type of information it's also great because it can do things like this where you say okay i've got an attack vector this is where the how they're going to come at us here are the techniques and here are the data sources that we have and how good they are at you know giving us visibility into that particular technique so that if i'm looking at something like you know uh persisting in in uh, schedule tasks or persistence in web shells. It's like, okay, if I'm looking at web shells, logs give me some data, but they're not, you know, great. Full packet and endpoint are great for, for you know, web shells, um, but NetFlow doesn't give me the data that I need, right? And you can have this chart and just chart out, here are the techniques that are going to be used against these particular, um, you know, assets or the, this type of attack vector, and here's the coverage of visibility we have on it fill it out like this and then this get, does two things for you one it lets you know exactly on a stoplight style or traffic light style um you know format here's where we have coverage and you can deliver this up to management and say hey here are the gaps that we have we would need this much more headcount this much more um you know uh, techno these technologies, whatever it is, to close these gaps. And that one either gets you more budget and the things that you need, additional headcount, again, all those things, or um, it just covers your butt so that if you experience a breach somewhere down the road and then you're like, oh, um, you know, yeah, we, we experienced a breach. It was this type of attack. Um, if you'll note when I delivered this, you know, data to you back in June, I gave you a report that said, here's where our gaps were for these potential techniques. And we said we needed budget for it when we didn't get that budget. So that that gap remained. And that is, in fact, how the attacker got into the environment. So instead, as a CISO or whatever, you are no longer the chief information scapegoat officer. You're still the chief information security officer and you just get to go back to your desk, um, which is nice. All right. So we're going to talk about, you know, network threat hunting today, like the labyrinth is about network threat hunting. So um, so how do we whittle down things to be um, from all of the raw data, all of the traffic to something that actually allows us to find, you know, something interesting? Well, uh, we start out with all traffic and then we pick a direction again, inbound, outbound, lateral, whatever it is. And then we're going to pick a protocol. So we pick a protocol or a service. And for me, I always start with the lowest number of, of sessions so i'll filter things out by a 24-hour time period i do that just because it makes things a little more manageable um, but also because i'm assuming okay if there's some activity it probably took place at least once within this 24 hours if i find that i can key in on that particular ip address or host or whatever it is and then expand my hunt to three days seven days whatever but dialed in on that particular user or resource so that now i'm not um, I'm, I'm more focused on the signal than I am on the noise. Um, we want to look for something that is, so once we've picked our protocol, we're going to look for connection specific anomalies, right? So things again, like direct to IP, you know, odd things in the bytes sent receive, whatever. We're going to look for protocol specific anomalies, um, things that go outside the RFC, like missing headers, um, that kind of thing. Uh, we're going to 
look at the session to one gain context uh, around you know what's going on there and then actually like rebuild it reconstruct it and and say is this something that is is genuinely bad or is this just something that looked odd for our environment but is in fact benign um now a good place uh, at least to start in, in, in my opinion our opinion at, uh, at rsa is with the as far as network hunt goes with the labyrinth now the labyrinth is something that myself and a colleague of mine, Matt Tharp, put together when we were hunters in the Cirque. Um, we realized that um, that we were at times duplicating effort, where um, we would spend time on something and be like, "Hey, man, look at this," and then be like, "Oh, I'm looking at that too," um, which isn't a great use of time when you've only got a couple of hunters and a limited amount of time for them to hunt. Um, and then we also had some of the junior analysts who were saying like, hey, I want to be a hunter. Or I don't even know where to start. What would be a good things to go look for? And so we got into a room with a whiteboard and spent some time uh, just drawing things out. And for us, this is uh, a good place to start when you're doing a network hunt um, to look for interesting things. Um, we call it the labyrinth because as you can see, it is a mess, um, but also because it lets us put David Bowie on a slide, which is always a bonus. And now um, I am going to roll into the labyrinth. All right, so as I mentioned before, um, direction is important. So in this case, we're going to start out saying, all right, I'm looking at inbound. We're going to pick a service. Um, in this case, we're going to start with HTTP. I would say um, when you're actually doing a hunt, um, I, I don't normally start with HTTP. As I mentioned before, I start with the lowest number of sessions, and I do that because it gives you like a quick kill. If you were to say like, oh, I want to look at all inbound RDP, okay, those are all fine, and you can just you know, like mark that off on a list where you're like, today I did you know, inbound RDP for this 24 hour time period. And today I did, you know, inbound, you know, uh, SSH for this time period. So it allows you to have some quick kills on protocols. Um, and also it makes it easier to hand off a hunt than saying like, I got through 5% of our HTTP traffic today. Um, just um, something to note. But um, if we're starting here with HTTP, um, we want to look for things like, uh, you know, in the HTTP methods, strange sequences. This is stuff like a post with no get, right? Normally when somebody's requesting a, a page, they're going to uh, ask for something first and then they'll eventually send something to the site. So if you're seeing traffic that's just being posted to a server without anybody actually asking for anything, that is odd behavior. It's odd for what's normal. And that again is what hunting is all about, is found, finding outliers, finding anomalies and seeing what they're all about. So if you see something like you know strange sequences within uh, HTTP, go and look for, for those things. When it comes to the URL or URI, we want to look for encoded query strings. So this is somebody who is trying to obfuscate something that is within, you know, the URL. So it, this is where you see like the question mark equals and then a bunch of stuff after it. Um, it used to be we would see stuff where it was just straight up like a web shell that would be like cat, you know, command equals cat etsy password in in the um, address bar, and you were just like, man, you're not even trying. And now the level of trying is just base 64 encoding it or something. So look for encoded query strings. Um, you know, find out what it is that um, that that individual is trying to, you know, hide. Also, um, short file name scripts. So um, this is something where you know again. Sometimes developers do this where they'll just be like a.aspx and you're like, well, what is that? Um, looking for, at short file names uh, uh, is interesting because, you know, attackers will often just name it something, you know, three characters or whatever. We, we go and look at those things. I also would mention that having a naming convention for your scripts is hugely valuable because you'll see when attackers get in the environment but they may not understand what that naming convention is and they throw a script out there and it just doesn't fit and again if it doesn't fit the way that's normal for the environment it's going to stick out to you so look for short file names and and uh and see what you can find there with headers like headers tell us things like you know how the page is displayed the operating system and browser that the people are using the amount of content we're about to receive the language all of this stuff is it takes a lot of things for us to display a browser uh, or a web page correctly in a browser um, and there's a lot of information that gets delivered to do that 
on average, if you go and look at just go, you know, Wireshark up a, um, an HTTP request, there is a lot of information in there. And you'll see something like 8, 10, 12 different headers. Um, what we're looking for here is when it comes to the number of headers is something like six or less. If it's six or less, that's odd um, for HTTP. And what we find is normally there are tools that the attacker has written or they are security tools that somebody threw together and they leave out certain things because it's not important um, to them or they just don't expect that, um, you know, that somebody's even going to be looking, honestly. Um, when it comes to the host, we already talked about direct IP. Um, so, but if you see direct IP communication, what is that? Um, it's good to take a look. Um, user agents. So, user agents again are how you display the page. It's going to tell you, uh, you know, about the browser. It will give you information that will let you understand like what operating system it is, and sometimes even you know like the the patch level of that browser um, or potentially the operating system. So, um, look for things that are old. If you see a user agent string and it's old and you're like what is why is somebody using internet explorer 8 to connect to things one that just may clue you into tell it somebody within our company is still using super old browser um you know it's like again that guy that unix gray beard in the closet on irc um, is using netscape navigator gold or something like that but um but yeah so look for things that are old that are just flat out old things that are bad. Um, this is stuff like um, Mozilla with a zero, um, or it can just be things where the um, the user agent is of a, of a tool of a of an offensive tool, and somebody has gone and thrown it out there, and they didn't take the time to go and change the user agent. There are different tools that do have their own user agents that are meant to test security that attackers love to use. Um, and they don't even take the time to change something like this. So if you see uh, what some known bad user agents are, then you can just, you know, uh, be like, oh, I know that that's that tool every time you see it. Um, user agents that are short. So you may see something that's just Mozilla 5, and that's great. That may be a valid part of a normal user agent string, but it's not valid. Um, <laughs> it's not a valid um, user agent as a whole. It could be part of one again, but it's not. User agents are really long uh, normally, and so uh, look for short ones, and then again, just add things to allow or deny lists as you um, come across them. Refers, if it's just missing, that's odd. Where somebody is coming from is normally something that you get when um, when somebody's visiting your site. Um, if you've ever hosted a site before, you know that you know doing analytics on stuff like, oh, I got a link from this blog post, or oh, a lot of my traffic comes from Google, or whatever it is. Like most places want you to know this is how they got to you. It's because of me, especially advertisers, because they're like, look, look how many people I drove to your website. If you pay me this much, I'll get even more there. Um, so referrers that are missing is odd, um, or if they're just strange, right? So we want to look for stuff where, um, you know, the refer is maybe coming from a region that we don't do business in. Um, you know, maybe it is, uh, you know, the coming from, from, you know, a potentially embarrassing location, whatever it is, um, where if you're getting traffic and it's coming from somewhere odd, it's just important to go look and see what is that thing, what was posted there, why is traffic being driven to me uh, from this particular uh, location. And then accept language, um, you know, what's the language that it's in? Now this is, you know, I will caution here, accept language does not equal attribution. You know, sometimes when there's a big breach, like people will, someone will come out and be like, it was North Korea, why? Well, the accept language said Korean. It's like, oh, you crack the case. Um, that's not, you know, by itself, that doesn't really tell you anything. Um, and just keying in on like, oh, the language was odd, may send you down rabbit holes you don't need. But if the accept language is Persian and it's coming, you know, and the user agent string is old and there's an encoded query string in it, then maybe now you care more, right? So all of these things can be used to build on each other where it's like, oh, if I'm hitting like two or three or four of these different odd things, then it's looking more and more sketchy. When it comes to content length, if it's missing, content length missing breaks the RFC. So, um, you know, it shouldn't be that way. You should know exactly how much uh, data you're about to receive. Um, if it's missing, that's odd. I have seen tools where it, uh, they don't add a content length because they just hard coded in or um, so it is just flat out wrong 
or they just don't add it because they're like, well, I know what I'm going to be sending, so I don't care. Um, so if you see a mismatch in the content length, then that is also an indicator that there is a problem. And in the body, um, this is where you'd look for specific indicators. This is, you know, um, where like, you know, trying to choppers like evals E1 and like stuff like that, where something that is actually alertable, potentially alertable. All right, SSL and TLS, it's encrypted, so there's nothing we can do about it, right? So we just move along. Uh, not necessarily, right? There's a lot of stuff that we can learn from uh, encrypted traffic just from the metadata that exists within that um, encrypted traffic, the protocol and cipher that's being used. You know, if somebody is trying to um, communicate with our server and they're using an old, um, you know, protocol or cipher, and we are like, yeah, sure, I'll do that. That's not good. We don't want to be using vulnerable versions of um, of different protocols. So we want to let the IT team know, like, hey, you know, the web servers responding to stuff like this. Um, self signed certificates, you know, being like, I am authoritative for me. I say I'm good. Um, self signed certificates is something to look for. Also, you know, I look for for things like let's encrypt and that type of stuff, right? So, like when you're looking at SSL and TLS, look for things that are again just outside of the normal. Why is something have a self signed certificate? Um, with DNS on the inbound side. Um, we just don't want to be part of somebody else's bad day. Um, so if you're not authoritative for somebody's domain, don't answer questions for it. Um, you know, we still see, you know, recursive DNS stuff being used in DOS attacks, um, you know, in 2020. So um, just again, don't be part of somebody else's bad day. Um, when it comes to SSH and RDP, right? Oh, that's bad, right? Somebody's connecting inbound, right? No, not necessarily. Um, we just want to take a look and see who's connecting, where they're connecting from, what they're connecting to, those things. Like go in and say, well, what, what are, what's at the other end of these things on both sides? Um, again, even though it's encrypted, we can learn stuff from the metadata. Um, you know, the client and server tells us something. The session sizes could tell us something. We're like, oh, we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, a lot of inbound traffic, but not a lot out. So it looks like somebody's uploading something or a lot of outbound, like somebody's maybe moving something out or taking something. Uh, even on each side, it's like, well, that could just be a command line session. We try to infer things, but honestly, um, when it comes to uh, encrypted traffic, with the amount that we're getting to now, if you don't have a decryption solution, it's probably start time to start looking at one. Um, all right, on the outbound side, a lot of this stuff is going to repeat, so I'll skip the things that are repetitive and I'll um, and I'll focus on the ones that are uh, where things change. So again, with outbound, we're looking at um, a lot of the same stuff, strange, but you know, old, short, or bad user agent strings, hosts that are direct IP, but also port numbers, right? If somebody's connecting directly to a specific port, um, that's something that you and I do all the time because we're giant nerds and we do that kind of thing, but it's something that my father's probably never done in his entire life. So again, this is about anomalies. So if you see somebody who's making a connection outbound over HTTP to a, uh, a specific port, what exists at, on the other end of that port? It's just good to go and figure that out. Um, let's see. And then things that are strange when it comes to hosts, look for signs of things like DGA, right? So domain generation algorithms are very similar in, in the way that or the best way I can use to describe it is it's like having your, you know, like your RSA token where the number changes every 60 seconds. And because you have some seed data and, and the server has some seed data, it knows what that number is going to change to and you, uh, you know, you, you get a new number and you never uh, have an issue. Uh, domain generation algorithms are similar in that, except they they do it with a host, right? So this allows for um, a command and control infrastructure to continue to talk to a server on the other end somewhere where it looks like a seemingly random domain, but because the command and control infrastructure and the server on the other end both know what that host is going to change to at a predetermined time, um, that communication can continue uninterrupted. Um, when we're looking for stuff with domain generation algorithms, we will often flag on things like um, four consecutive consonants. Um, and we actually, and this is a true story, we used to flag on three, but it flagged on the Polish language a lot, so we had to switch it to four. Um, and so look for stuff like that, strange um, hosts. Uh, I already mentioned dynamic DNS, so I won't beat you over the head with it. Um, if the refer is missing, content link missing, wrong, 
the body. Um, again, specific indicators and in here on the outbound side, this is stuff where we're looking for like one by one iframes or, um, you know, the uh, like small Java jar files, that type of stuff. So look for those things um, within the body. SSL and TLS, same issues as before, right? Except um, we did throw in here interval. And now this is true of, of really any protocol on here, but we threw it in under, under SSL and TLS because we see it a lot where command and control uh, traffic, where it's just, you know, calling out over an encrypted channel, uh, you know, X number of times a day. If it's 1,440 times a day, that's once a minute. Um, if it's some factor or multitude thereof, um, that can also be of interest too. Now, different command and control, you know, uh, infrastructures will do different things. You can say, oh, I want to randomize it. Only once every five minutes I want it to call out or once every hour I want it to call out. But if you see very short connections and they are in, again, some factor or multitude of, um, <laughs> of that 24 hour time period, then you can say, OK, it looks like this is beaconing and, and take a look at that. Um, DNS again, dynamic DNS. On, uh, but when it comes to tunneling, right, if we see something like a large number of subdomains, um, this could be a potential sign of exfiltration that where somebody's using the subdomains as a way to encode data and move it out low and slow, right? So they're just connecting um, to a particular host, but they're changing the subdomain over and over and over again. And that's how they're slowly moving data out of the environment. And it is slow. It's not a lot of bandwidth, right? Used to be a lot more. You'd see subdomains that were enormous because that's how they were, you know, getting data out of the environment. But they, you know, attackers realized that we caught onto that pretty quick, and um, and now you see things. Usually, it's you know, like like 16 bytes or something like that. Um, so if you see large number of subdomains, that can be something that you want to pay attention to. Um, it could be somebody trying to exfiltrate stuff out. A large number of one subdomain could be a sign of, um, again, beaconing. Um, so we look for something where it's just calling out to one particular subdomain, you know, over and over and over again. If we see lots of null and text records, this is a, you know, a good way of, of getting some data out as well. Um, it's, you know, fairly high bandwidth in comparison to the large number of subdomains version I was talking about. Um, so look for a lot of um, null and text records or just straight up file transfers where you can see a file header that's being sent as well. The thing is this will trip on zone transfers um, as well, um, but you know, you'll get pretty good at identifying that rather quickly. Um, and you'll also sometimes see stuff where we'll see a file transfer over DNS and we're like, oh, somebody's trying to tunnel something out over DNS and they're sending a file out. And it turns out it's um, your antivirus solution. Like Sophos does this, McAfee does this. Um, there's some other security tools that do this as well, where they just know about DNS tunneling and how to do file transfers over DNS. And they're like, well, I want to get the data I want out of that environment without hitting some you know, block or firewall somewhere. So I'm going to use a file transfer over DNS. And so we've been in environments before where we're looking at it and we see a file being transferred over DNS and then we're like, oh, it's just Sophos sending something out. So um, interesting to, to see. SSH and RDP outbound, bad, right? No, not necessarily. Um, something that's also important to point out about um, SSH and RDP is that sometimes the, you'll, your organization will just have a support contract with somebody. Like I know, um, you know, like, uh, like Dell EMC does this where it's like their large storage arrays where it's like you can buy a support contract where you can just tell support I'm having a problem and they just SSH into your device and manage it. So um, that is uh, something to look for. But again, uh, it's not something that's normal. So we go in and find out what's on the end of each thing and we can say, oh, that's, you know, support connecting into that device. ICMP, right? So ICMP tunneling, where we're seeing straight up file transfers, other protocols being sent over ICMP. Um, we want to pay attention to things like a large ICMP echo request and reply, where we see differences in the um, request or reply padding. So there's a lot of padding that's sent, um, you know, in a ping. And so uh, if you see differences in, in what those request and reply paddings are, that can be somebody who's just trying to move something out um, over ICMP. So pay attention to stuff like that. Um, FTP, yes. FTP in 2020. Um, we like just before every uh, all of the quarantine stuff happened. The last um, or one of the last customers that I went to visit 
um, was a large financial institution. Um, they, I was like, what are you sending out over FTP? And they're like, oh, we don't use FTP. And I'm like, I assure you, you do, because um, I'm looking at it. Um, and it looks like you are sending files out over FTP once every 24 hours to a, a server in this region over here. And they were like, oh, no, we're not. And I'm like, oh, yes, you are. Um, and it was all in the clear, username and passwords in the clear. We knew what the files were because we had full packet capture. We could pull them out of the out of the stream and we opened up the files and they were of a sensitive nature and all whatever. So attackers still using FTP. And in this case, um, you know, to great effect, they were getting exactly what they wanted um, from this particular organization at once every 24 hours for, um, I honestly don't know how much time because we didn't, we, uh, I was just hunting in there and handed it off to their IR team once um, the discovery was made. So FTP still uh, still being used by attackers. You know, usernames and passwords are interesting. Sometimes you'll uh, you'll get the handle of the individual and the username, and usually like a nice swear word in the password. So you learn new words. That's nice. Um, we also see um, FTP sometimes being used for command and control, where we'll see a lot of store and retrieve um, messages being sent or TCP SYN beacons. So pay attention uh, to FTP, look for stuff like that. Um, I will say in the same vein as like this FTP, going out and looking in organizations and then have like, people will just say like, oh, we don't allow these protocols. And we find those protocols that people say, oh, we don't allow that all the time, whatever it is, if it's FTP, if it's BitTorrent, if it's, you know, um, RDPing the stuff, if it's IRC, whatever the thing is, they'll say, oh, we don't allow that. And we find things that are supposedly not allowed uh, all the time. And then, of course, there is like the other bucket. Now, this would be something where you don't have a parser for a particular protocol. This is the type of thing where somebody decided to put in a lot of effort, you know, roll their own type of deal. This is like when Poison Ivy came out. Everybody was like, whoa, they actually spent some time like really working on this thing. That's impressive. Um, and I know it sounds odd to, to be impressed by attackers or um, or criminals or whatever, but sometimes like you're like, oh, that solution is actually um, fairly elegant for what it is that they're trying to do, whether I agree with it or not. Um, but um, we can again try to infer things in the same way that we do with like encrypted traffic until we can get a parser put together. You know, it's like, all right, well, I can try to infer some stuff based on the amount of data being sent or how it's being sent. Um, and then another thing that's fun to to do in the other bucket is look at entropy. Um, so entropy being the amount of randomness in something. Um, and if we were looking at entropy on a scale of zero to one, where one is super fully encrypted, completely random, um, and zero is not at all, nothing random about it whatsoever. Um, human readable language normally falls somewhere in like the 0.45 to six range or six, five. Um, and then really well done encryption so things like um you know signal or whatsapp or whatever uh, they fall in like the 0 0.97 0 0.98 range on, on that zero to one scale where we want to hunt is somewhere in like the 0 0.75 to 0 0.85 like realm you know somewhere in there where somebody is encoding something or they're um or they're encrypting something poorly like they're trying to roll their own but it just shows that somebody is one trying to hide something and that is sometimes a really good place to go and look so when you get beyond your clear text type of things go and look um, at entropy for um, for things where it looks like someone's trying to hide something and um, but maybe it's just not being done super well that that is the labyrinth um, Thanks. <laughs> does does anyone have questions? Any comments? No questions at all. We learned them good. <laughs> Got to thank you. Great presentation. So Neil, I mean, again, yeah. You have a gift in, in, in speaking this, and this is my second time hearing this. I love it each time. Um, just thank you, and again, thank you all CSA members for your time and your support.
Yeah, please um, let me know if any questions come up later, or you know, you can you know reach out to me uh, on the Twitters or whatever if you have questions or uh, or need anything. I'm more than happy to to respond. And then please jump on the CSA circle. I think I'm the only person on there right now, and I'm so lonely. So um, get on the IR and threat hunting circle uh, on the CSA site, and let's have a conversation. Cool. A lot of great jobs, um, you know, that are in the chat right now. Awesome. Well, thank you. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Jason, I don't know if you're still on. Oh, Gary, can you hear me? I can hear you. No, it's working. Okay, I, I, I'm constantly getting messages during the presentation that my uh, so my microphone wasn't working. So I apologize for any disruptions and thank you for bringing it to my attention because I had no idea. <laughs> no problem. All right. Hopefully, we'll get a, a nice response for signups for the December workshop then. Uh, you mean November? <laughs>